Okay, so now we will talk about RL circuits, and these are resistor inductor. L stands for inductor here. <clears throat> so in this case, the symbol for an inductor is a coil. You might also see it simply written like that or something as well, same diff. So I like the little coil loops. So if you recall, induced EMF, according to Faraday's law, so it says that it's equal to the negative number of turns times change in flux over change in time. What was that negative sign for? Well, that was the lenses law part. It says that the EMF opposes the change in flux over time. So it's just that it's opposing it, and that's where lenses law comes into play. So in this case, when we look at the EMF, so in an inductor, we find that it's not opposing the change in flux over time. What's the, in, what's the inductor actually opposing? change in current over time. And so that's exactly what we kind of alluded to earlier. It's opposing the change in current over time. And so what you find out, because it's opposing the change in current over time, the change in the value of the current is decreasing. That slope is decreasing the entire time until you finally reach that constant maximum current flowing through your circuit. <clears throat> cool, but keep in mind, at time zero, you're gonna have no current flowing through and it'll gradually grow to that maximum with that slope getting less and less and less steep because that inductor is opposing the change. Okay, so going back to this lovely guy here, <clears throat> uh, the EMF through an inductor here is negative L delta I delta T. And again, that negative means we're opposing the change in current over time. And if we look here, we've seen that graph before. For something that's growing exponentially here to a maximum value, where did we see an equation like this before? Capacitors, dealing with capacitors. We saw similar things, and not so much for uh, just the current, but we looked at voltage, charge, and current, and stuff like that. So in a capacitor, the current was always decreasing, and we just had this e to the negative t over tau, whereas for something that's increasing, it's one minus e to the negative t over tau. And in this case, let's talk about I max for a second. So because we can actually talk about I max, and it's just follow Ohm's law. This thing will eventually reach its maximum. We said over here, what would eventually the maximum of this lovely circuit be for the current? Two amps. So we just followed Ohm's law there, and we didn't actually have a formal inductor in here with self-inductance, but even if we have a formal inductor, so just kind of cover it up for a second and say, what's the maximum current going to eventually reach? And it's just following Ohm's law. And so instead of putting I max here, we could actually put the EMF over R, just Ohm's law, for that I max value. And so at any given point in time, this is what your current's gonna equal. And if you plug in a big enough time, go to infinity, let's say, what's e to the negative infinity? Zero, and so one minus zero is just one, and you end up with just your I max value. So that's the nature of that equation there. So this whole second term goes to zero when as time goes into infinity, yep. So tau here, if you recall with RC circuits, tau just equal to R times C, tau now equals L over R. So that's how we'd actually calculate it for plugging into this equation for LC circuit, I'm sorry, for LR circuits or RL circuits. And is that L inductance? That's the inductance, measured in Henry's. Cool. So one more thing to talk about here. I'm gonna get rid of this. And that's the potential energy stored in your inductor. And so to just differentiate it here, we talked about potential energy stored in a capacitor. So I'll put that with a C. Anybody remember what the formula for potential energy stored in a capacitor was? There's a couple different ways, but one that I particularly liked was this guy. And so go along in the same fashion. One looking similar. So one half the inductance times the current squared. So how do we store potential energy in a capacitor? Separation of, charge. Separation of charges. We're getting a build up of positive charges on one plate, negative charges on the other plate of that capacitor. How are we storing potential energy in an inductor? Well, as the current through our coil here builds up, what's also building up? That's running right down the middle of the coil. Magnetic field. So we're actually storing the energy kind of as a magnetic field in this case.
Okay, so let's, let's put that diagram back up and let's get rid of a couple things we don't need here. We don't need that guy. So we're gonna approach that maximum as time goes to infinity. If we look here, then what's the current at time zero? The moment I close some switch in this circuit, let's just put a switch in here. So the moment I close that switch, what's the initial current? Zero. zero. Well, let's look at that then. If the initial current is zero, then what's the potential drop across our resistor? Zero. And if we have no potential drop across that resistor, well, notice Kirchhoff's law says that your potential drop on any fixed loop all adds up to, or your potential change all adds up to zero. So any potential increase at the battery has to be balanced by potential decreases somewhere. Well, if at time zero you have no potential drop across the resistor, what does that imply is taking place at the inductor? Well, careful. So if I, let's say this is a 12 volt battery. If I got a 12 volt battery here, if I have no potential drop here at time zero when that switch is closed, that means all the potential drop must be right here. If I have a 12 volt increase in the battery, then these two together have to experience a net 12 volt drop to balance it out, Kirchhoff's laws. So if I have zero potential drop here, then it all has to be here. At time zero, the entire potential drop is across the inductor. Why, why is there none across the resistor? There's no current. So if you recall, what's the potential drop across your resistor is IR. And if there's no I, then there's no potential drop. Okay. Cool. So initially, the entire potential drop is across the inductor. Now, if we look at this in question number eight here in a minute, this is drawn a little differently, but whatever. So 12 volts, 4 ohms, and 8 millihenry. Now, eventually, we're going to reach a maximum in current. And what is that maximum current going to be? So given enough time. Uh, so that's not a current. Oh, I'm sorry, three, three amps. Three amps, which can use delta V equals IR, right? We'll ignore the inductor for a minute. So, and eventually, so delta V equals I times R, so I must be three amps. And so eventually we're gonna reach a maximum of three amps. When we do reach that maximum, what would be the potential drop across our resistor? 12 volts, which means what would be the potential drop across our inductor at that point? Big fat zilch. So notice they're kind of trading places. Initially, there's no potential drop across the resistor and it's all across the inductor. But once we reach the maximum current, the entire potential drop built across the resistor and none across the inductor. Cool. So let's answer a few questions about this lovely circuit. So eight, what is the current passing through this, the resistor after a very long time, or a very long time after the switch is closed? And we just figured out that. It's just simply delta V equals IR. And that's where we got the three amps from. Second question is that, uh, in this in part number eight here, is uh, what is the potential drop across the resistor immediately after the switch is closed? And what did we say that was? Zero, because there's no current passing through it. What is the potential drop across the inductor immediately after the switch is closed? And we said? 12 volts. 12 volts. And how do we figure that out again? Uh, at time zero, V equals IR. So and that, how does that help me with the inductor? Um, the inductor and the resistor all have to add up to the power source. Good. 12 volt increase here has to be matched by 12 volt decrease between these two, according to what? Kirchhoff's loop rule. Kirchhoff's loop rule. So if there's no potential drop here, then all 12 volts have to be across the inductor. Even though there's no flow of current, there's still a potential drop. Correct. So even though there's no flow of current, there is a potential drop across the inductor. So which one was question that one? So that is number eight, part three. The fourth part to number eight, says, what is the current passing through the resistor two milliseconds after the switch is closed? What is the current passing through the resistor two milliseconds after the switch is closed? So this is not a just simple reason it out kind of question. We're gonna actually, actually use, okay, what is the current passing through after two milliseconds here? So first part, what is tau? 
L over R, what was L's value? So 0 0.008 henrys, so a millihenrys. So, and then R? Four ohms, and so what is tau gonna be equal to here? And what are the units on that? Henry's per ohm, that's correct, which you might also better recognize as seconds. <laughs> well, if you notice, it has to have units of time here, because I'm taking time over time, and the units are canceling. Cool, so it says that our actual tau here is two milliseconds, and we're wondering, you know, how much current is actually passing the resistor after two milliseconds. So we're gonna plug in two milliseconds over two milliseconds here, essentially. And so it was our max current again, 12 over four, which is the three amps, times one minus e to the negative 0 0.002 seconds over 0 0.002 seconds. Cool. Can anybody get me a current out of that? We'll go 189. 1.89 amps. Cool. What you find out is that this thing follows a kind of predictable pattern here. If you look at this equation with the exponential, is that for every time constant, so if that exact time constant, you'll be at 63 point something or other percent of your current, and that's about 63% of three amps. Cool, the last question asked in, in number eight, the last part of that question is, what is the potential energy stored by the inductor a very long time after the switch is closed? So what is the potential energy stored by the inductor a very long time after the switch is closed? So, well. Uh, Is potential drop in the equation for potential energy stored in an inductor? Oh, no. It's not. Notice, how do we store the potential energy in the inductor? Current. Oh, well, not directly, but what's actually, we're storing it in magnetic field. And what causes the magnetic field? Current. The current. And so it's not so important the potential drop, but it's the current passing through it. And since that grows over time, the potential energy we are gonna have grows over time. And so the, question, the reason this question is you know, worded, what is the potential energy stored by the inductor a very long time after the switch is closed? is that's telling us to in, in, you know, in, you know, figure out that the current is how big? Current, three amps. So the, the max, we've reached that. And so in this case, your potential energy, your inductor, and can anybody get me a value here? Point oh three six what? Joules. Yes. Awesome. Joules. So if you recall, a lot of times in first semester we make all the units work and stuff like that. I take faith that when I do things in SI units, the units work out to give me what I need. Potential energy should be joules for the SI unit, as long as you use henrys, not millihenrys, and amps, it should work out. And I just kind of take it on faith. And can we prove it? Yeah, we can. It's just going to be a lot of work to do so. Chris. So for potential energy to actually be there, you have to have a current going through. Correct. So how much potential energy was being stored in the inductor at time zero? Zero, and it gradually grew, which kind of makes sense.